Today, our senior Silverado is getting a heart transplant. We're yanking the tired old 350 in our low buck sport truck and building up a 383 stroker crate short block with a hot cam and new EFI. It's all today here on Truck Tech. Hey guys, welcome to Truck Tech. We're back working on our 93 full-size Chevy short bed truck that we've named our Low Buck Sport Truck. And as you can see, well, this certainly doesn't look low buck anymore. With its brand new paint job, updated front end, new wheels and tires, lowered stance, and a cowl induction hood. Since we've taken care of the show part, it's time to look into the go part. And as you can see, there's something missing. Now the engine we pulled out of there has 260,000 miles on it, but it ran okay. But at that point, it's safe to assume that it's well-worn and you've gotten your money's worth. Now, like I mentioned, it started right up, didn't make any weird noises, but it was burning oil and you could smell it through the exhaust. And one of the biggest indicators that he's got some excess blow-by, well, he took the time to convert his oil fill cap into a breather element to help expel some of these excess fumes. Not good. Now, we could strip this engine down, send it off to the machine shop and do a bunch of work and build the engine that way. But we've got a short block sitting around that we've got our eye on. Now this short block started out life as a 5.7 liter or a 350. Thanks to Summit Racing, it's now a 383 stroker. Or for you guys that are really sharp, the 40,000 stamp in the top makes it a 385, technically. But that's not that important. More is more. What's really important are the components in this short block. One piece of remain seal, Keith Black pistons, ARP rod bolts, four bolt main caps, and a scat crank, making this a very stout short block with tons of potential. Now this is a factory roller cam block, making an upgrade to a roller camshaft a snap with no extra parts to buy. But as you can see, well, there's a lot of stuff missing, including that roller cam. Now to turn our short block into a complete engine, we've got a table full of parts. Now our Summit 383 shipped with a flex plate that's matched to the balance of our rotating assembly. But we've also got a new harmonic balancer, quality ARP balancer and head bolts, a new timing pointer, a Mr. Gasket timing cover and some hardware, a new comp timing set, and a comp hydraulic roller camshaft along with a set of new hydraulic roller lifters with the necessary guides, hold downs, push rods, and some new 1.5 to 1 ratio comp roller rocker arms that'll be held down by some posi locks. Now when it came time to topping off our engine, well, we wanted a budget friendly cylinder head. So we picked up a pair of Summit Racing iron vortex style heads that are a big improvement over the stock castings. Now they feature 67 cc combustion chambers, 1.94 intake valves, and inch and a half exhaust valves. And these things, as shipped, can handle a max valve lift of 520 thousandths. And the cam we've got spec'd out is within that range. Now our extreme energy cam has a gross valve lift of 0.495 on the intake side and 0.502 on the exhaust side. We're definitely safe with that 520 thousandths max lift number. It's also got a duration at 50 thousandths of 218 degrees on the intake side and 224 degrees on the exhaust side. And like usual, make sure you don't nick the cam bearings during installation. Slow and steady is the way to go. And with a cam in place, we can install the cam retainer plate. Then we can move on to installing the crankshaft sprocket. And make sure that the keyway in the crank gear lines up with the keyway in the crankshaft and that the reference mark at the top of the gear for cam timing is at the 12 o'clock position. Then we're going to press the crank gear into place by using pieces of our harmonic balancer installer and a small piece of exhaust tubing. Heating up the gear and smacking it on with a hammer just isn't the smart way to do it. Pressing it on is definitely the recommended way to install this thing. With that done, then we can install our true double roller timing chain and sprocket for the cam, making sure to line up the previously mentioned reference marks so your cam timing is correct. They need to be lined up straight up and down. Also, don't forget to line up the dowel on the front of the cam with the corresponding hole in the sprocket. Then we can install some new bolts with a little bit of red Loctite applied to make sure the sprocket always stays attached to the cam. Then we torque everything to 20 foot-pounds. 
All right, now if you're putting together a stroker like this, one thing you need to look out for is connecting rod to camshaft clearance. What happens is the big end of the rod swings awfully close to the cam lobe. If you're running a traditional rod bolt with the bolt head at the top and a nut at the bottom, it's even more of an issue and even tighter. We're running ARP cap screws, so that eliminates that problem. Plus, they've beveled the top edge of this rod to create even more clearance. Now, our cam is kind of mild and not that much lift, so we're in good shape. But you're running a big lift cam? That's something you definitely want to check for. Up next, see how modeling clay can show you piston to valve clearance. Stay tuned. Hey guys, welcome back to Truck Tech, where we're in the middle of our 383 small block buildup for our 93 Chevy pickup. Now, so far, we've shown you a few interference or clearance issues in between the rotating assembly and our block. But there's one more thing we want to check, and that's piston to valve clearance using this modeling clay. a tiny little bit of oil to keep the clay from sticking to the valves. Now you need to use the head gasket, but it will flatten out if you torque down the bolts. Now most manufacturers will give you a compressed gasket thickness, and that difference needs to be taken into consideration. The bolts just to hold it in place. You don't want to compress the gasket. Now in doing this procedure, you need to use solid lifters or some type of lifter that won't compress. Otherwise, the heavy valve springs will override and compress our hydraulic rollers and we'll get inaccurate results. Now, in our case, we've temporarily modified the lifters so they won't compress. That way we get a good reading. Another way to do it would be to swap out the heavy valve springs for some really light springs and do the test that way. All right, now just like we expected, with such a mild cam, we don't have any clearance issues, but it's always good to check. You can see the intake valve, we had the slightest little bit of compression here. We've got over a quarter inch gap, and that's forever in engine building terms. On the exhaust side, it didn't even make a mark. We're in good shape. Then it was time for a new timing cover gasket and our new chrome timing cover. Now these bolts only get snugged up. You don't want to over tighten them and warp the cover. Then it was the installation of our harmonic balancer. Now you don't want to use the original harmonic balancer bolt or anything like that to pull the balancer onto the crankshaft. It puts a lot of stress on the threads of the bolt and the threads in the crankshaft. So if you're going to be tackling a job like this, it might be a worthwhile investment to pick up a Matco harmonic balancer installer. Then we can install our new timing pointer. All right, now our timing pointer is adjustable and we want it pointing at the top dead center location or mark on the harmonic balancer. So we're gonna use this bridge tool and a dial indicator to find TDC and lock down our pointer in the right location. Now, never mind the actual numbers on the gauge. We're not after a particular reading, just the peak measurement to indicate the piston at the top of its travel. And with that found, well, we can lock in our adjustable timing pointer and know that we have a 100% accurate timing indicator. Then, after giving the lifters a quick bath in engine oil, we add the lifter guides and the lifter hold down. Then, after one final wipe down of the block deck and the cylinder head mating surface, we can drop the new head gasket and cylinder head in place for good. Now, these bolts go through a water jacket so we applied some Loctite thread sealant to make sure we don't get any coolant leaks through the bolt holes. Now to tighten down the head bolts, I'm just running them in loosely with the impact. Then I'll get out the torque wrench and torque everything to spec. Make sure to follow the correct torque sequence and procedure when tightening the bolts to spread out the load evenly. Then we can torque the bolts in three different stages, finally ending up at 70 foot-pounds. Then it was time to drop in the push rods, which we coated on either end with a little assembly lube. Same with the top of the valve stem. Then we dropped our new roller rockers in place, getting everything ready for a valve adjustment. Take this one to zero lash, take all the slack out. You can feel it. All right. Then we'll take our lash adjuster and go half a turn and tighten down the lock. And with our crank pulley in place, we can install our new balancer bolt and torque it to 80 foot-pounds. Cool. 
Now, the guys next door who build engines all the time told me to check out this Comp Cams Valve Train Spray. Sprays on, gets sticky, and will protect the valve train on first startup, even if the engine sits for a little while. Hey guys, welcome back to Truck Tech, where we're in the middle of prepping and cleaning up some parts from our old 350, getting them ready for installation on our new 383. Now our blasted all media cabinet gets used fairly often, and you can see why. It's doing a great job of cleaning up these old parts. That oxidized old dirty aluminum comes out looking like new. So after blowing the dust off of this thing, Kevin hits it with a couple of coats of Duplicolor high heat paint. First, a light ground coat, followed by a heavier second coat. I guess we could have gone with Chevy Orange, but would have stood out against that blue paint. So with all of that stuff out of the way, we were getting ready to reinstall all the painted parts and get ready for the Super Trick intake manifold and EFI system to go down in the valley. Ran into a slight problem with the stock valve covers. Because of the roller rockers, well, we've got an interference issue. So we took these supports out, took them completely away, and still, even though the cover will go down and mate the surface, there's still gonna be an interference issue with the rocker arm. So plan B, we gotta wait on the brown truck and get a new set of aftermarket valve covers that will clear the rocker arm setup. So no harm, no foul, we didn't waste any money, we just have to spend a little bit more. Now so far, there's one thing we haven't talked about on our new 383, and that's the fuel injection system. Now the EFI on our old 350 here was just a TBI system with two injectors here in the throttle body. And while it's a decent system, it got this truck to 260,000 miles, it's just not that receptive to performance modifications. While you can make it work with a few modifications, well, it can kind of be finicky. And rather than try to make this somewhat antiquated system work on our 383, well, we're just going to jump up to the modern era of multi-port fuel injection. Now, the system we're going with is a self-learning system from FAST, or Fuel Air Spark Technologies. And it's their Easy EFI 2.0 system, good for up to 550 horsepower on small block Chevys. Now, this is a pretty comprehensive kit. It includes the wiring harness, a plug-and-play distributor, the FAST ECU and handheld display, a couple of wideband O2 sensors, an in-tank fuel pump kit with pump, regulator, and gauge, enough fuel hose to hook everything up, and of course, all the fittings and clamps necessary. It also includes a nice aluminum intake manifold, a four-barrel, 1,375 CFM throttle body, eight 39 pound-an-hour injectors, and all the fuel rails and sensors you're gonna need for this system to run. Also picked up one of the optional fast E6 CD ignition boxes and one of their coils. Now, in looking at the giant cavernous hole of the empty engine bay, we wanted to bring your attention to a couple of the systems that we left connected. The first one being the air conditioner. We did not discharge it, didn't disconnect the lines for a couple of different reasons. We don't have to go through the expense of having it recharged, and we don't have the equipment to discharge it environmentally safely and responsibly in the first place. So it stays, it can be cleaned up just like it is. The other system is the power steering system, where we just disconnected the pump from the accessory drive. What this does is keep you from having that fountain of schmutz happen when you do a hard left turn or a right turn, and you keep your shop floor clean and keep the stuff off of your clothes. One more thing I wanted to talk about, look at this. This is a finely polished hardened steel fastener. Now we don't know exactly what it's for or what its intended purpose was, but I think we may have found that inherent rattle that the previous owner found out about or was telling us about when we bought the truck. But with the engine out, we've got the opportunity here, even if we're not gonna paint anything, to take and clean this truck. So we're gonna load it up on a trailer, take it to the local coin op, and get rid of some of that massive, ugly layer of greasy, greasy dirt. Hey, welcome back to Truck Tech. Well, the engine, well, it's looking great, and we know it's gonna run every bit as good as it looks, if not better. We got a head start on the accessory drive, the water pump, the cooling's in place, as well as the fast EFI. And those of you guys that are paying attention, well, you know that this 
is the water neck. It's not a vent tube like in the old style V8 engines. And there's no place here on either valve cover for crankcase ventilation. We got to have a vent in it because the pressurized air is going to find a way out either through a gasket or a seal. So we've got a little project to do. Now, got some options for real estate. Right here we've got all kinds of flat area on the top of the cover. And right about here, it looks like there's plenty of room to where we can get it up high enough and in between these two rocker arms and have the real estate and the location that we want. So basically, I'm going to go right about here. So X marks the spot, a little bit of tape measure to confirm, rock and roll project. Now measuring off the end of the cylinder head, we can find a spot for the breather that's not going to interfere with some moving rocker arms. Starting with an eighth inch pilot hole and stepping up to the medium sized step bit, and we can go for the big boy to create an inch and three eighths hole. Now the last thing you need on your freshly built engine is metal shavings. So a hand file and a little bit of sandpaper, make sure that doesn't happen. Nobody wants aluminum shards floating around in their oil. Now this breather adapter is baffled and that'll prevent hot oil from splashing directly into the breather, but it will let the vapors out. And these breather adapters can be used for open element breathers or for PCV systems. We may end up installing another one on the other side to do just that. And since we don't have an oil fill cap, this will be a convenient spot to fill the engine with oil. So the engine is this close to being ready to be stabbed in between the frame rails, but we're obviously going to put it in as an assembly bolted to a transmission. And since we're way beyond stock power levels with this stroker, it doesn't make any sense to bolt up the stock transmission to it, never mind the 200 plus thousand miles that are on this one. So a rebuild and an upgrade is in order. And that's next project on Truck Tech. Hey guys, if you're in the market for a new TIG welder, but you find that some of the advanced machines with all their buttons and knobs and adjustments are a little intimidating, we need to check out the Miller Sinker Wave 210. This user-friendly machine can do AC or DC TIG welding along with DC stick welding. And it's got the Pro Set feature, which takes some of the guesswork out of setting up the welder. Or you can make your own adjustments using the menu and the adjustment knob and take advantage of things like the adjustable pulse setting. And on the side, there's storage, we've got a foot pedal in here along with some of the extra cables, and it uses the MVP plug, which plugs into the either household current or 220 shop current. Now distributors have been around for ages, but it doesn't mean they can't be updated with modern technology, like this one from Mallory. The CNC billet Mallory Max Fire distributor has all the features of a modern digital CD ignition box built right into it. It'll fire multiple sparks at lower engine RPM and has full electronic timing control with seven pre-programmed advanced curves where you can design your own using their software. It's also got built-in rev limit functions and a map sensor that can handle up to 30 pounds of boost and can retard ignition timing proportional to those boost levels. Pretty cool for a distributor. Now if you guys are really serious about diesel performance, you need to check out this custom race engine from PPE or Pacific Performance Engineering. This thing's got a full host of internal upgrades, making it capable of withstanding up to 1800 horsepower. Now this thing also uses PPE's dual fueler kit, which adds a second fuel pump to work in conjunction with the factory fuel pump. And it's controlled by their microprocessor. This fuel system also features PPE's ported fuel rail fitting, which eliminates a factory restriction. So whether you're in need of a complete race engine or just a fuel system upgrade, check out PPE. Guys, thanks for watching Truck Tech. See you next week.